Let's welcome Professor Lorenzo Avizi. Well, it's a, whoa, it's a big honor to be here, and I'm only sorry that you cannot see yourself because you're beautiful. Uh, but uh, I have some of my current students that used to be where you are just a few years ago, and when I asked them for advice about this talk, they told me, make it exciting. So I thought that what I would do is to tell you a horror story. Uh, so imagine that you are tied to a table somewhere deep underground, and the only sound you can hear is the swoosh of a gigantic pendulum that is moving above your head. There, is a, there are a couple of problems. The pendulum at the end has a blade and is getting closer and closer and closer. And that's, this setting is the setting of a classic story by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, um, which is you know, a classic uh, writer of thriller story, American writer. And I'm sharing this to you, with you, not just because it makes for a great story for Halloween, but um, because I think that this image captures uh, the condition of all people of today's uh, database programmers. See, database programmers also have been at the mercy of a pendulum that has been swinging above their head and sometimes inside their head, between, you know, swinging between two seemingly irreconcilable goals, ease of programming and performance. Uh, the pendulum started squarely pegged on the size of ease of programming with abstractions such as serializable acid transaction. But then uh, it started moving. And over the last decade, with the uh, surgence of the NoSQL-based movement, it has really started swinging fairly dramatically towards performance until people have started to recognize that it's really hard to program in those models, and the pendulum has started to swing back again. But still, it's not a comfortable position, the one of our friend database programmer. So let's actually look a little more in detail about what is motivating the swinging of this pendulum. It uh, all started with uh, acid transactions uh, and their promise of uh, simplicity and generality. And indeed, uh, let's face it, uh, acid guarantees are nice. It is nice to know that all I have to do is to wrap my code inside a transaction to have the guarantee that it will be executed atomically, that it will be isolated from other transactions, and that its effect will be durable. And it is nice to know, when I'm reasoning about uh, the correctness of my code, that all I have to do is to make sure that each transaction individually transitions the state of the database from a consistent state to a consistent state without having to worry about the internal logic of all the other transactions in the system. So there is no question that uh, ACID uh, guarantees are nice, but the question is, can we afford them? And that's a question that we have been struggling with uh, for a while. Actually, uh, it was uh, the uh, database community that started moving the pendulum somewhat to the right by starting to explore uh, notions of isolation, and you see some examples up there, that are weaker than serializability, and basically being willing to give up some simplicity of programming in exchange for performance. But during the last decade, uh, this, the movement has become significantly more dramatic with the development of this approach called the BASE approach. Uh, so BASE, uh, supposedly, is an acronym that stands for basically avail available, soft state, eventually consistent, but truly is just a nerd joke, right? They just wanted to say that they're not acid, and so they're BASE. And uh, in fact, uh, the BASE approach has really not a lot of patience for acid. 
They take transactional guarantees and they just blow them away. They destroy asset storage and substitute uh, for it something that has a much simpler interface, something like put and get on top of um, a key value store. And all of this is supposed to give programmers the capability of squeezing every ounce of performance from their code by writing custom code. The problem is that with, uh, in this case, with great power comes great complexity. Without the uh, uh, guarantees of transactional storage, it's up to uh, the developer to actually implement at the application level the consistency guarantees that are necessary to make the application be correct. And that is hard, because one has, uh, without transaction, one has to think about all the possible interleaving between all possible operations. And that's something that uh, becomes exponential in terms of the interleavings that one has to consider with the size of the application. And soon, uh, complexity gets out of control. And that gets us back to our story. And what I would like to share with you today is what uh, my students and I have learned trying to get this guy out of this situation. Okay? And I hope it's going to be, you know, you're going to get something, not just out of the technical solutions that we have come up with, but also about the way in which we have been trying going about it. So uh, the challenge here is that the very thing that can give us more performance, which is increasing concurrency, is really what makes programming difficult. And you can see an example, for instance, if you look at this simple transaction, a transfer transaction that transferred $10 from a checking account to a saving account after checking that uh, there is enough money in the checking account. And one can imagine uh, increasing concurrency by actually splitting this transaction into two pieces. One piece that takes care only touches only the checking account, and another piece that touches only the savings account. And the idea is that I get more concurrency because instead of executing, say, two instances of transfer sequentially, now I can overlap their execution to some degree. I can have uh, the second part of one instance of the transfer overlap with the first part of the second instance of the transfer. So what can possibly go wrong? Well, what can go wrong is imagine that there is another transaction, say, that we are going to call balance, that actually uh, accesses both the checking account and the saving account to try to compute what is the total amount that this individual has. Uh, it used to be the case that balance was going to uh, be run either before the transfer transaction or after the entire transfer transaction, and so it was going to compute the balance correctly. But now, having split the transfer transaction, we are actually exposing to balance an intermediate state that was not visible before. And as a result of that, as you can see, balance may actually compute the wrong result. What is really disturbing about this is that as soon as we try to increase concurrency, and even if we touch a single transaction, that may actually force us to have to rethink correctness about of every other transaction, because we have to think what are the consequences of the new interleavings that uh, we are allowing. And, um, and it seems that actually this is an instance of a fundamental problem. If I want to have concurrency, uh, I have to, for better performance, I have to increase the interleavings that are visible. But if I increase the interleaving that are visible, it becomes more complex reasoning about the correctness of my program. And so we have this dilemma. And this is where we turn uh, to this guy. His name is uh, Wilfredo Pareto. He's a fellow Italian. And um, he's known for, most known, for something that is known as the Pareto Principle. The Pareto Principle says that in many systems, 20% uh, of the causes is responsible for 80% of the effect. In computer science, sometimes we have an even more extreme version of that. We hear of the 90-10 rule, right? Uh, so what we did 
was actually to download and inspect uh, applications, you know, database application, open source database application, and we saw that the Pareto principle also also there. So if you want, not all transactions are created equal. Uh, there are only few transactions that actually stretch the performance capability of the asset paradigm. Most transactions don't. They don't either because they run infrequently or because they are lightweight. They um, uh, have little, uh, they, they run for a short time, or they have little conflict with other transactions. And so, if it is true that there is this imbalance between the behavior of transactions, that actually brings new light to these trade-offs that exposing interleavings brings up between complexity and performance. Uh, see, for most transactions, Exposing more states and allowing more interleavings only brings complexity. It doesn't really pay up very much in terms of performance. It's only for a few transactions, these few performance-critical transactions that the Pareto Principle says that exist, uh, that the complexity actually produces also a payoff when it comes to performance. So then, if, if that's the case, then an idea that comes to mind is, what if instead of exposing this greater number of interleavings um, indiscriminately, we were to do it in a selective way? What if we were to expose those interleavings only to the few transactions that can actually gain performance out of it and make them completely invisible to the rest of you know, the remaining transactions? And uh, if we did that, then we might get a, a solution that gives us most of the performance that we would be able to get if we were to actually expose the interleaving to everyone, but at a fraction of the complexity. And uh, this is the idea that guided us in designing a distributed database system that we call SALT, because we are also nerds, and SALT is what you get when you put uh, a base and an acid together. Uh, the idea of SALT is to actually uh, leverage the observation that not all transactions are created equal, and uh, if you want specialized, provide a flexible uh, abstraction, transactional abstraction, that allows the few transactions that are performance critical to selectively uh, take advantage of these exposed uh, states. So, um, the abstraction that we have um, introduced, we call it a base transaction. And the way in which you can imagine basifying, if you want, your ACID transaction is as follows. You take the ACID transaction, and then you partition the operation in a sequence of, uh, of sub-transactions that we call, again, a sort of a silly joke, we call alkaline transactions. And uh, there is something, and you can think of alkaline transactions as mini acid transactions. And there is something, there are a couple of things that are really nice about base transactions. The first thing is that they, to maintain some of the uh, simplicity of the acid paradigm, they continue to provide atomicity and durability at the granularity of the entire base transaction. But when it comes to isolation, they actually allow to, as you will see, they allow to selectively expose the state that are intermediate between uh, successive alkaline transactions. Uh, so that they actually, this base transaction can actually look differently depending, as you will see, depending at which other transaction are interacting with. At the core of uh, this capability is a new isolation property that we call salt isolation. Salt isolation creates an illusion, a little bit like the image that you see there. See, if you look at that image, if you tilt your head on one side, um, it looks like a duck. If you tilt your head on the other side, it looks like a rabbit. And uh, salt isolation plays some similar trick. Uh, to base transaction, another base transaction looks as a sequence of distinct alkaline transaction and allows other base transaction to um, interleave at the granularity of alkaline transaction. But instead, to all remaining, the large number of acid transactions that are remaining, 
it looks like base transactions are just acid transactions as before. Nothing looks to them as it has changed. So, um, so they look like a single monolithic acid transaction. This means that, again, if a base transaction runs concurrently with another base transaction, they can interleave at the granularity of alkaline transaction. If instead it runs concurrently with an acid transaction, the only states that are visible are the states that are are the states that are either before or after the base transaction, as if that base transaction were an acid transaction. So um, you may ask what kind of uh, result that this uh, work provide. Well, um, there are two questions that uh, we wanted to answer. What kind of performance we are able to get by using this salt approach as opposed to simply the acid mechanism? And the other thing that we wanted to ask is what programming effort is actually going to be required in order to get reasonable performance? Um, so we, I'm showing you just two experiments, you know, uh, uh, two simple experiments on, uh, that um, are about two applications. One is TPCC, which is um, uh, a database benchmark that uh, models online transaction processing. And the other is Fusion Ticket, which is an open source um, online ticket purchasing application. And as you can see in these graphs, um, when compared with MySQL cluster, we are getting in both cases um, a throughput that is at least 6.5 times higher than the throughput that one could get with a simple, uh, the original ACID mechanism. How much work was it required to actually get that kind of significant um, throughput gain? Well, it turns out that for TPCC, all we had to do was to basify just two transactions in order to get 80% of the benefit. Basifying a third transaction gave up 100% of the benefit. With Fusion Ticket, we basified one transaction, got up remarkable um, improvement in throughput. Then we started basifying a second, not much different. Basifying a third, not much different. The problem is the more transaction you start to basify, the more difficult becomes thinking about the correctness of what you're doing, because you start having this problem of having to think about the exponential explosion in interleavings. And we didn't want to basify the 11 or 12 transactions that we would have to do in order to basify everything. So we actually took a very extreme position. All we, what we did was to chop each transaction in its raw operation and just run them as raw operations. Of course, the result was incorrect, but it was giving us an upper bound on the amount of performance that we would be able to get if we had basified. Certainly, we would get something no greater than we would get just by chopping without worrying about correctness. And what we are seeing is that basifying a single transaction allows us to get 90% of the performance that we would get if we had just chopped blindly. So, you know, when we looked at these numbers, um, you know, we felt pretty good. Uh, we thought, uh, uh, you know, perhaps we have actually done something, uh, you know, created some damage also to that, to that pendulum that was swinging around. Uh, and, and then, we, you know, I started going and telling people about the result that we have had, and uh, people would say, uh, that's great. What about those few transactions that you have to basify? How do you do that? And I would say, well, you know, that is hard. Basifying transactions is always hard. But the good news is that you have to do it only for few. You don't have to do it for all the transactions. And I would say, that's great. But how do you basify those few? Huh? So the problem is that, unfortunately, uh, basifying transaction is still hard. And, and our pendulum is, is far from being destroyed. Um, and so, you know, when we got this kind of feedback, um, so we started asking ourselves, I don't know, I mean, what, what can, you know, what do these programmers want? We, I, we had the feeling that they were trying to send us a message, but we just couldn't quite understand what was the message that they were trying to send us. And then it dawned on us uh, that uh, what they were trying to point out is that uh, we were trying to find a sweet spot 
between the base approach and the ACID approach. But when it comes to ease of programming, for many applications, there is really no sweet spot outside of the ACID paradigm. As soon as you move out, it's not a question of sweet, it's a question of how sour it is going to get. So what we then decided to do was to say, OK, you know what? What we are going to do is uh, we are going to, instead of trying to weaken the ACID paradigm, even if selectively, we are going to instead embrace it completely. And we are going to um, uh, try to uh, find a way to provide uniformly this ACID abstraction for all transactions, but we are going to try to do it uh, if you want, in a way that is a little more uh, uh, performant, if you want. So um, the observation that we are going to leverage is once again the observation that not all transactions are created equal. Before, we were trying to um, leverage this observation by uh, providing a flexible abstraction. Instead, here we're going to use a uniform abstraction for all transactions, including the ones that are performance critical. What we are going to instead do is to tune the mechanism that, is going to be, uh, that we are going to put in place in order to implement that abstraction. And that led us to develop a second um, system, database, that we call Callas. If you don't know who this person is, you do yourself a favor, Bing her. Maria Callas, one of the best opera singer ever. And um, so Callas provides a uniform abstraction, acid abstraction, to all transactions, but allows that abstraction to actually be embodied, if you want, in a number of different ways. Okay? And um, the uh, architecture of Callas is actually based on a key observation. The observation is that if, for ease of programming, uniformity, the uniformity of the abstraction is fundamental, when it comes to performance, having a single uniform mechanism can actually hinder performance and uh, preventing, to, if you want, to be able to take advantage for opportunities for optimization. The uh, observation, if you want, to put it in a different way, any mechanism, concurrency control mechanism, that has to work for all possible abstractions, for all possible transactions, we'll have to necessarily make uh, you know, conservative, um, conservative assumption, and in the process, give up the opportunity to actually leverage some interesting optimizations. So then what uh, Callas does is it decouples uh, abstraction from implementation. It provides a uniform ACID abstraction to uh, everyone, but it introduces a new technique that we call modular concurrency control that actually allows Callas to uh, partition transactions in groups and then assign to each group a customized concurrency control mechanism that only applies to the transactions that are in that group. And then, have a cross-group concurrency control mechanism that is going to handle conflicts that may exist between transactions in different groups. The idea is that we can be more aggressive by um, when, when we are trying to just apply a concurrency control mechanism on a per-group basis. So if we are focusing, the, the, the observation that we are making is that Modular concurrency control allows us to leverage another fundamental principle of system design, the, princi the principle of separation of concern. Separation of concern allows us, when we are thinking about the correctness of our in-group mechanism, of worrying only about the transactions that are in that group without worrying about the transactions that are in other group. And this is important, of course, for proving correctness. It makes proving correctness much, much easier, but it is uh, uh, crucial also when it comes to performance. Because the idea is that if we, we can actually be much more aggressive when we are trying to optimize the concurrency control mechanism within each group, because the optimization doesn't have to hold for every transaction, just has to hold for those few transactions. And um, 
Before, I'm going to tell you more about how this modular concurrency control mechanism works. I want to tell you, uh, you know, at the end of all of this, you have to be confident that what you're building is actually correct. And the foundation, the theoretical foundation for our work are in the uh, beautiful, elegant work of um, Adia, Liskov, and O'Neill that actually um, identify conditions for you know, what are the conditions for defining different notions of isolation, and in particular, what condition must occur in order for isolation to be violated. In particular, one of the things, the, the key condition that they say must hold to prevent uh, the violation of isolation is uh, a condition, the condition of no circularity. Circularity that is defined on what they call a direct serialization graph. This is a graph that has as nodes committed transactions, and edges capture dependencies that exist between these transactions. Let me give you an example. So for instance, here I have uh, two transactions, and uh, on top I'm showing uh, what you know, the direct dependency uh, graph would look like. Suppose that the first transaction uh, writes variable A, the second transaction reads it, then transaction two depends on transaction one, and we are going to no, uh, express that notationally with an edge with, that connects transaction one to transaction two in the direct serialization graph. Now suppose now that transaction two actually writes B and then transaction one writes B, then there is now a dependency from two to one and there is a cycle in the direct serialization graph and that's not good, okay? Uh, if there is a cycle there, that would mean that serializability in this case would be violated. Okay, um, so uh, what we then want to guarantee is that our modular concurrency control approach, it's going to uh, ensure that there cannot be cycles among all the transactions in my system, and I'm going to split that enforcing that guarantees in two parts. I'm going to say that I would like to make sure that there are going to be no cycles within each of the groups, and then under the assumption that there are no cycles within each of the group, that there are no cycles that actually involve uh, potentially multiple groups. And what I would like to do is to start by telling you how we can handle the latter part of the problem. So uh, the mechanism that we use to um, prevent these um, dependencies across multiple groups is something that we call nexus locks. It's a new flavor of locks, okay? Um, nexus locks are, again, supposed to prevent circularities or handle, if you want better said, handle dependencies or conflict that exist among distinct groups, transaction in distinct groups. And nexus locks are ubiquitous. Every time um, a transaction wants to touch an object, it must first acquire the nexus lock for that object. And nexus lock have a dual nature. Uh, when it comes to uh, transactions that are in different groups, then nexus locks behave like regular locks. They prevent transactions to proceed unless the operation in these two transactions do not conflict, like read and read. Okay? But instead, when it comes to, to transactions that are uh, Trying, you know, are conflicting on a lock within the same group, they're just going to say, please go ahead. Uh, the goal of Nexus locks is to try to guarantee correctness while trying to stay as much as possible out of the way of the potential performance gains that using the in-group mechanism can give us if we don't want these Nexus locks to be intrusive. Okay. Uh, so, uh, um, so it sounds great. <laughs> Unfortunately, if I just acquire Nexus locks, it turns out that that's not enough to guarantee that there are not going to be cycles across groups. Let me show you an example. Here is, I have, I'm going to have two groups, uh, the red group and then you'd see a green group. In the red group, I have a transaction that starts by touching A and uh, writing A and it acquires the Nexus lock on A. Then there is another transaction that is running concurrently within the same group, also tries to write A, but because they are in the same group, it can just simply acquire the nexus lock. Okay? No problem. 
Then the transaction, there is a dependency, of course, that is generated between T1 and T2 because uh, they are touching the same object. Um, then transaction two, say, uh, writes object B and then acquires the corresponding, corresponding Nexus lock and then it commits. After it has committed, there is another transaction, a green transaction from another group that tries to, that wants to touch B. Of course it can touch B because there is no running transaction that has a lock on B. Transaction two has already committed. So it can acquire B and in so doing generates a dependency between uh, T3 and T2. And now say that transaction three uh, then touches C and then commits. And now, to just make our life really difficult, transaction one is going to touch C. And when that happens, that generates a dependency between transaction one and transaction three and actually closes a cycle. And you can see that I can have now a cycle that crosses, you know, spans multiple groups, even, with the, even if there, is, there are no cycles within each of the groups. That's really bad. <laughs> um, so to try to solve this problem, what we did was to go back and look at how transitional locking takes care of this problem. Traditional locking, um, what it does, it actually ties the notion of depending, so depends on, is tied to um, completes before. So here, if I have a situation, you know, the situation that you see there, uh, transaction two is actually not going to start executing until transaction one has released these locks. And transaction three is not going to start executing until transaction two has released this lock. And that guarantees that there can be no circularity. Fundamentally, completes before is a non-circular uh, relation. And by tying depends on to completes before, one guarantees that also depends on cannot have cycles. Okay? Um, and now, if we now look at uh, the problem that we had, it's clear what was the problem. The problem is that Nexus locks only tie uh, depends on to completes before for transactions that live in different groups. For transactions that are in the same group, it doesn't. And it, 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 it chooses to do that on purpose because if it did tie it, then it would prevent transaction one and transaction two from executing concurrently, and so we would lose performance. It, we would become intrusive, and we don't want to be intrusive. So how do we uh, solve this problem? Uh, well, we, we you know, the way in which we ended up solving it was by making an observation that I had the opportunity to make many times in my uh, career. Sometimes you see that there are systems that are providing a certain guarantee. And there is a certain implementation that provides that guarantee. And if you look carefully at that implementation, you discover that that implementation provides that guarantee, but actually provides something stronger than the guarantee that you need to enforce. So you have uh, the implementation, if you want, is sufficient to provide the guarantee that you want to enforce, but is not necessary. And fortunately, this is the case also here. It turns out that um, what we end up doing is Instead of tying depends on to completes before, what we do, we tie it to the weaker notion of releases its nexus locks before. So we have, uh, we, ins you know, we, we uh, enforce this nexus lock release order that says that if T2 and T1 are in the same group and T2 depends on T1, then T2 cannot release its nexus lock until T1 has released its nexus lock. Let me show you what that means in our example. In traditional locking, these two would have to execute sequentially, right? And instead, um, what we are going to do is we are going to allow them to execute concurrently. And in fact, at this, when transaction two is committing, transaction two will notify the user that it has committed and will actually release any resources that transaction two was keeping in order to maintain isolation within the group. But is going to hold on to the nexus locks until transaction one has given up its nexus locks. And this is enough to prevent the cycle from occurring with transaction three while allowing transaction one and transaction two to execute concurrently. Um, 
So I told you about uh, isolation across groups. Let me tell you about isolation within groups. Isolation across groups was fundamentally trying to be safe and not be in the way of performance. Isolation within group wants, of course, to be safe, but it has to do it while trying to squeeze performance out. Otherwise, uh, where, is, you know, where is the gain? And it turns out that the ability to think modularly is going to play a critical role here because um, it's going to allow us to use um, in a more, you know, intuitively, is going to allow us to use uh, optimizations that may not work, as I was saying, for all transactions, that may work instead just for the transactions that are within each group. And it turns out that, in fact, modularity is going to help not just with new techniques, but also with techniques that have been around for 20 years, and it's going to be able to bring new life to these techniques. Uh, one example is uh, a technique that was developed 20 years ago uh, by Shasha and others uh, called transaction shopping. This is a very, very, very nice idea that I let me share with you. The idea of transaction shopping is uh, to take transactions, and then, using static analysis, identify what is the finest chopping of this transaction that is going to guarantee that serializability, despite the chopping, will be satisfied. Okay? You use static analysis to be able to provide that guarantee. And that has the beauty that every, any performance that I can get out of this technique comes for free, because the programmer has no additional task that is required to perform. So when transaction shopping works, it works great. Unfortunately, it doesn't quite work as often as we would like it to work, or as effectively as we would like it to work. Uh, the problem is that uh, in order for a shopping to be um, safe, what it has to do is to uh, prevent what are known as SC cycles. To understand what these SC cycles mean, imagine that I take, as you have seen, these transactions and I chop them, and I connect the pieces within a single transaction with something that is called an S edge. And if there are conflicts between pieces in other transactions, they are connected with something that is called a C edge. Okay? A situation like this, no good. Huh? Because it contains a cycle that involves both S and C edges, and so what we would have to do is to say, sorry, this chopping was too aggressive. We have to make it coarser until we have eliminated all the cycles. OK? So uh, the idea, you know, the way in which uh, modularity is going to help is that instead of having the requirement that we don't want to have SC cycles among all transactions, now we can actually specialize it only to the transactions with, that are within a group. As long as there are no SC cycle within this group, then I can chop. Even if that chopping would be unsafe for all transactions, it might just be safe for the chopping within each group. And it turns out, as you will see, that modularity can already help significantly in taking, getting performance out of this old technique. But uh, it turns out that even with the uh, you know, this insight. Traditional transaction shopping, um, traditional transaction shopping still often provides shopping that is too coarse to actually get performance out. And one extreme example of that happens when I'm considering potentially self-conflict between transactions. For instance, consider this situation in which I have two instances of the same transaction. These transactions are writing variable x, y, and z. What I would like to do is to try to chop them. Well, if I chop them, um, what I see is that the only way to actually chop them that does not involve an SC cycle is not to chop them. <laughs> and I would have to actually keep them uh, you know, all together, getting no uh, concurrency out of it. So what instead we are going to do is to introduce a new mechanism that we call runtime pipelining that is going to try to solve this problem of self-conflicts. Again, let's look at these transactions that I was showing you before. Now, suppose that actually at runtime, uh, what happens is that transaction one touches x, 
And then transaction two touches X. What that means is that there is going to be, if you want, a dependency that is generated between transaction one and transaction two going from left to right. The observation is that we can avoid cycles from this point on. To avoid cycle, all we need to do is to make sure that all the other dependencies are going to have the same direction. So intuitively, what we are going to do is to, if you want, use the arrow of time to break the cycles. At uh, static analysis time, the C edges are undirected edges. But at runtime, they have a direction. And if we make sure that these different dependencies are all in the same direction, if we schedule transaction appropriately, we are not going to have any cycles. What are the consequences of this? Well, we can take this situation that was unsolvable before, and now instead we can pipeline the execution of these transactions. So that as soon as the first transaction that executed the first piece, we can start executing the first piece of the second transaction in parallel with the second piece of the first. Okay? Um, and there is another advantage that comes from using this runtime mechanism, the fact that at static analysis time, of course, I have to be pessimistic when I'm considering possible conflicts. I have to consider as, as conflicts every conflict that may possibly arise. At runtime, I can actually detect if precisely when a conflict arises. I don't even have to trigger this runtime uh, pipelining mechanism until a conflict has actually arisen. Now, if you look at this simple example, um, you see that the, uh, the C edges, one of the properties that it has is that the C edges are parallel. In general, if I look at a, uh, a transaction that I'm trying to apply this technique to, there is no guarantee that C edges will be parallel. They may well be crossing. And one of the things that we had to do was to develop a general uh, algorithm that actually is guaranteed to take whatever we throw at him and uh, basically eliminate the crossing between C edges uh, so that uh, what I'm going to have at, at the result of this is going to be another graph where the C edges are parallel to, the, to each other. Um, so actually, uh, it turns out that um, this, you know, this uh, technique that we have developed, if you want, takes transaction chopping that was providing the finest safe chopping and refines it. It actually does allow now choppings that are unsafe. But only those unsafe chopping that runtime pipelining can then break at runtime. Um, so, uh, at this point, one thing that I haven't discussed is how are we going to group these transactions? I talked about grouping. How are we going to group them? Well, it turns out that, once again, uh, we can rely on the fact that uh, there is this, this, this observation that not all transactions are created equal. See, for most transactions, it doesn't really matter how we group them because there is not a lot of performance that we can get anyway out of them. So what we can do is to put them all together. Uh, so only a few are going to matter. So the remaining, we can put all together in what um, we may informally uh, call the lame group, but let's just call it the generic, you know, some kind of generic group in which I'm using some standard concurrency control mechanism. And when it comes instead to the few transactions that are performance critical, since they are few, I can actually exhaustively explore what is the grouping that um, actually provides the best performance. And we have uh, some kind of greedy algorithm that approximates that idea. So finally, how does something like this work? There are a lot of questions performance-wide that you may want to ask. The only question that I'm going to answer now is how good does it do when it comes to end-to-end -end performance? And here are some graphs, again, for TPCC and Fusion Ticket. And let me walk you very quickly through this graph. The first thing that you can see is that in comparison with MySQL cluster and Fusion Ticket, uh, for Fusion Ticket, we get a, a throughput a push of uh, you know, a factor of 6.7 for uh, TPCC 8.2 times. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's kind of encouraging. Um, 
And it's um, nice to see that uh, if I just use transaction chopping without modular concurrency control, you see that it helps to some degree in the case of TPCC, but it doesn't help at all in the case of Fusion Ticket. It doesn't find a way to actually chop the transaction safely. But if I'm using um, modular concurrency control with traditional transaction chopping, you see that we get a pretty substantial gain from modularity just by using traditional transaction chopping. Of course, if instead of transaction chopping, we use what we use in Callas, which is runtime pipelining, we solve the problem of self-conflict, and, and throughput really shoots up. And what is remarkable is that in both cases, we are able to get within only 5% of the throughput that we were able to get with SALT. The difference is that in SALT, we had to actually ask the programmer to basify certain transactions. Here, we are asking the programmer to do nothing at all. And we are getting within 5% of the performance that we were getting for SALT. So that actually uh, will come to the end of my talk. Um, I showed you two different systems, uh, SALT and CALAS, that you start from the same observation. Not all transactions are created equal, and actually draw very different conclusions and very different ways in which they are trying to leverage that observation. And um, when it comes to our friend in our story, um, I, I like to think that you know, he's a little, a little uh, better off. Um, you know, what, what can possibly go wrong? So that's the end of my talk. <laughs>